Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you that may be tuning in for the first time, my name is Dan. I'm the associate pastor here at New Life Church, and it's my privilege this morning to be interviewing Pastor Ross Westfield. We're going to tease through some of the bigger themes from the church series as a whole. Um, but, but just before we get into that, we just want to acknowledge some of the technical difficulties we've had this morning. We do apologize for that. I hope that the audio is coming to you now nice clearly um, but please do bear with us we've if they, and for whatever reason um, it's just not quite going uh, the way that we had anticipated this morning and it kind of it throws some things into a bit of light relief for us really doesn't it that actually it reminds us not to take ourselves too seriously um, but one of the things that Russ says very often is that though we don't take ourselves too seriously we do take what we do seriously and I hope that comes across this morning literally as we were counting down um, Ellis who's on tech this morning gave me a two minute warning and I was joking with Russ saying that if this was like the great the couch at the Graham Norton show or something it would be about this time that we'd be getting our final touch-ups done for our makeup or you know they'd be putting some bronzer on your head to take the glare off like <laughs> any number of things would be happening in two minutes beforehand it's and true. instead we're sat here in silence just watching the clock waiting for the moment where we get a big thumbs up so hopefully now you can see us you can hear us and we're coming through nice and warmly it's what we're going for this morning so Russ thank you for um, agreeing to this interview this morning and um, we just thought it'd be a great opportunity to kind of kick around some of the bigger themes and um, what is it do you think that's uh, struck you most what is it what one thing have you enjoyed most perhaps about preparing this series for us this year well let me just say before I answer the question for the viewers at home that um, I can give permission this morning for most of our technical crew to not have to focus on Jesus. It's been very <laughs> difficult for them this morning. There's been so many technical things going wrong, getting used to the new gadgetry and that kind of thing, that uh, I'm not going to give anyone a hard time for not being spiritual this morning. There's That's been, very gracious of you. <laughs> yeah, there's been so much technically uh, going wrong. That uh, that's okay. You have permission, everyone, not to focus on Jesus, just to get this broadcast out. That's fantastic. I think. Uh, look, this series, um, which has been called simply Church this time, previously has been called Ecclesia or Ecclesia or however many ways you want to pronounce it. And um, why I enjoy preparing this series is because for me, and I've said this so many times. It's very difficult to read the New Testament without seeing that this strange, weird, messed up often, certainly mixed up, sometimes gathered, sometimes scattered organism called church is, to, is front and center. It revolves around Jesus. Jesus is through it like a golden thread and, and it re revolves around Jesus like, uh, you know, spokes around a, a hub. But... You just cannot escape church. And, and therefore, if you see it throughout every page of the New Testament, apart from maybe the Gospels, where you see Jesus modeling some things about church, um, for me, because I can't escape it, I just want to talk about it, you know. And we're going to spend a lifetime and more getting it anything like right um, but let's give it a good go. So I, I think every two years I do this series called uh, Church or, or whatever we might call it in the future, just looking at three or four fundamentals of uh, are, we, are we doing this thing anything like what Jesus would have expected? No, I think that's a great thing to consider every couple of years, just within the life of a local church. One of the things that you've said before, you may have even said it as part of this series, that if Jesus is the hero of the New Testament, then you better you better bet that the church is the main character. Right? Yeah. And I think you see that outside of the Gospels, like you say, um, Jesus is the hero very much within the Gospels and continues to be the hero throughout the rest of the New Testament. But this main character called church comes to front and center really quite early on in the New Testament. Um, and I get which, then, by the way, can I say, is feminized can. in the New Testament. Yes. So when we talk about the church, um, if we were to be true 
to the the genders used in the New Testament, uh, she's a wonderful thing. Indeed, yeah. It's yeah. one of the only times I will ever be referred to as a bride, yes, for example. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Which I'm, I'm glad about. Yeah. Because, you know, all the additional pressure that comes with being a bride at any other time seems to be, the church seems to be let off the hook slightly when yeah. it comes to wedding planning, for yes. example. Um, so I get then, I get that this is a great thing to look at every couple of years as a local church. And I get why it matters to us as a church, but does, does these themes that we've been considering over these last few weeks, do they matter to anybody outside of the local church? Yeah. Well, they matter to us, don't they? Simply because if we are someone who said yes to Jesus, we are part of the church, whether we want to be or not. Um, I guess the, the question following Jesus they are part of the church. It must be important to them whether they want it to be or not. The, the question for all of us is then, do we behave like we're part of something or do we behave as if it's just us and Jesus? But the main part of your question was, yes, does it matter to people outside? Not in any way the same way. Yeah. Look, let, let's face it, most people outside, I, I think surveys would show that they believe Jesus is a horror, historical figure, but nothing else, nothing else really special apart from the, the depth and the breadth of his, his teaching. So what matters to them is that this organism that we're part of, and I'm going to try and use that word rather than, you know, organization, yeah. <laughs> even though it, it should be organized, is is expressing the things that we say our founder expresses, yeah. right? So if Jesus, if, if Jesus says, they will know that you are mine because of your love for one another, then that love for one another should spill out into community and society. Uh, and that's what the world is interested in. Actually, they're not too bothered yeah. that you're that you live the way you live because you're responding to Jesus's love. They're not bothered about that bit. Yeah. But what they're bothered about is, is the way you live according to who you say the founder is? Because that will then stop any flow of their, <laughs> their view through you to Jesus, you see. Yeah, yeah. So, look, we know, don't we, through the ages that we can pinpoint lots of things when church has misbehaved greatly horribly horribly and and still sections of the church are having to sort that out and yeah. say sorry for things in the past yeah. but um look we, without the church globally um most schools in the world wouldn't exist no, very true uh most health care on the ground in the nitty-gritty parts of the world wouldn't exist so many of those kind of social action things wouldn't exist yeah. the third sector as we call it the charity sector is the, is a huge provider of help for any society and the biggest part of the third sector is church yeah. so it does matter to people outside the church but more because of what we get up to right rather than who we belong to yeah. they no, may good. find who we belong to because of how well we represent him no i think that's i think that's brilliant i think um i think it was gandhi back in the 50s and i'm paraphrasing here who well said i that, followed his hairstyle of course gandhi. i mean yeah i mean you're, you're pulling it off very well yeah. or, or not pulling it off as the case <laughs> may be um i think it was gandhi who said that he he loved the churches uh, the christian christ um, but he just couldn't find an, a, a reasonable image of him within the church yes and i think that's a real sadness for me and and while you know Gandhi was writing in the 40, 30s, 40s, and 50s, I I don't I don't imagine that that criticism has gone away with time. Shall we say um, there are still pockets of the church, and like you said, both historic and more recent, where where the image of Jesus has been hard to come by in the organisation of his church. And I think that's a real sadness for me. And part of the reason why I've loved this series as a whole is just a chance to kind of recapture some of what it is that Jesus called us to and to try and assess and to um, to reflect on whether or not we look anything like the church that Jesus imagined. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a great thing to look yeah. at every couple of years. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that struck me, though, over the course of this series is that um, 
pre-COVID, you know, we're going to use that term today, pre-COVID, we were in gathered church quite a lot. It was something that we did weekly, if not more than once per week. Um, at different time slots, we'd have different youth events running, friends and partners, a whole host of program running across the course of a I calendar week. I think I can remember that far. I back. mean, it feels like a very long time ago yeah. since we were kind of Isn't subjected it be strange to that doing that all program. Again at some point? It is going to be like preparing for a marathon, I think. We're going to have to put some training in to get used to those kind of those rhythms of life again. Um, but one of the things that struck me, actually, as I've just been reflecting in my own life, is that I, I often came to church with an anticipation or an expectation um, to express something of my gifting or maybe to encourage somebody else. And that seemed like the most normal place for me to outwork any of my Christian character was in gathered church. But kind of what I've been reflecting on is that what you were saying, particularly about scattered church and this idea of this sent people who have been gathered together for corporate encouragement, corporate should then leave that gathering to when they walked in. Would you just talk to us a little bit more about that? Yes. So, um, yeah, I think I mentioned the, the verse, didn't I, that when we gather together, each of us should bring some manner of encouragement. And uh, and Paul's uh, St. Paul lists some of those encouragements that yes. we could bring. Yeah. Now, we, we also need to remind ourselves that the setting he was talking into there was what we would call small groups. <laughs> yeah. Um, rather than what we've been used to in an auditorium. That would have been pretty foreign to them, anything of, of no, that very kind true. of size. Um, let's face it, you know, 200 odd of us in an auditorium, each bringing an encouragement and given airtime would be a long service. We would be there for a considerable length of time. <laughs> but yes, look, the easiest place and the most natural place for us to be an encourager to one another is when we're gathered. And I think that should be the case. Uh, and yeah, there, there are a great wealth of scriptures in the New Testament talking about how church should behave with one another. Yeah. Okay. Down to the nitty gritty, even. Uh, and it's fascinating, some of the stuff Paul, St. Paul digs into. But so how we behave with one another, I guess, should be the most normal, the most natural way as an outlet for our encouragement. Yeah. But sentness, to, you know, we are blessed to be a blessing to the world for god so loved the world and uh, and therefore i think i i, I put it this way a gatheredness is to breathing in what sentness is to, to yeah, breathing okay. out so we have to breathe out is being an encouragement harder outside of the church and inside yes and it always will be and i think the reason is whenever you step outside of your family you have to be braver yeah okay it you requires need, something different of you you need some courage okay when we do read what the early church got up to it's interesting that we do find most of the the big deal encouragements yeah manifestations of the holy spirit do happen outside of the church right? okay yeah. outside of a gathering yeah um from the very first one we read you know peter and john i think it was on their way to the on their way to yes. the temple yeah uh, and uh, and prayed for someone, and uh, this lame man walked. And I, I think that um, that little phrase, on your way, should be important to us. So how can we increase our bravery and our courageousness that when we are on the way to places in our normal life, that we still feel as much a sense of being an encourager as we do when we come to church? Uh, and I speak to myself here because, you know, you get ready to come to church and you put on your outer garments, but you do get ready. Lord, give me something. Lord, give me something to yeah. encourage someone today. Yeah. Why don't we do that when we set off in the morning to work or to school? No, because very good. That's where most people are, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that waitress who's serving you, who's got it slightly wrong, should we be the people who are rude to her or who to think, or who think, Maybe she's going through a tough time and we can be the person who brings some light into her life today, right? Yeah. That's not natural for us, is it? And I think this is where the... I'm going on one now. Sorry, but, I'll read you back. <laughs> the, I think of those two words that, again, uh, are used about the church and therefore about us as individuals. We are citizens of a different place. Yes. 
we are citizens of a better world to come. Uh, and we're called whole nation. Uh, you know, there, there's a nationhood about us that belongs to Jesus. So the way we live and show our ethics and our values out there in the world should be different yeah. to how everyone does it. Yes. And does that take bravery? Well, it must do, or else Jesus wouldn't have said, and I'm sure slightly exaggerated, <laughs> I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Yeah. Right? It's going to take some courage. Yeah. So I, I hope, you know, as a church, we can all, me included, beef up our weak area okay. of being an outward encourager. As well. No, very good. I, it's that phrase on the way, isn't it? It's yeah. such a critical, for, and like you say, with, with Peter and John in those early chapters of Acts, but it's something that I think they learned from the life of Jesus. Um, you know, we, we read in the Gospels these half kind of sentences, things like, and then Jesus went from Nazareth to Capernaum. Yeah, yeah. And that, that takes what? It takes multiple days. And yes. so clearly a lot of things happened just on the way on to the way. places. You read through Mark's gospel, for example, where everything seems to happen immediately. And Jesus is always up from moving from one place to another to another. You know, Jesus left Jericho on the way to Jerusalem and something happened on the way. And I, I wonder whether or not we've we become maybe we've become fixated on places rather than on journey um, and so we read through the new testament and we focus on places like jerusalem like jericho these big hot spot names that we can visit today perhaps um, and yet we forget that the majority of what jesus did and said happened on the way between these places yeah, yeah. yeah. so one of the things that we do here again pre-covid as a local church is a, is a short course called first steps right it's a three-part okay. course yes and at week one of that you go through uh, some of the history and heritage of new life church now um for people who, who perhaps aren't so familiar with pastor russ's story and his involvement with new life church here russ you've been part of new life for more than half of new life's life just just i mean yes. it's, it's it's probably not as close as you'd like it to be no true but yeah. um, but so new life was founded what mid mid to late 30s yeah yeah mid 30s yep okay so you've been part of new life for for not all of that time i mean for, but for a considerable amount of that mm. time and mm. um, one of the things that my the, wife has been part of it for longer. Can I just get that in? Yeah, I, I wasn't going to say that. No, that's that's up. I mean, if you want to land yourself in that kind of trouble, that's on that's up to you. That's I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, so one of the things that you talk about in that first week, and it's something that you've um, you've written a book on, a book called Flow, which is available uh, on Amazon Kindle. Um, you don't have to read it. I've read it. It's worth a read. Um, but it's been designed for kind of church leadership teams as a conversation starter, right? So one of the things that you talk about on week one of First Steps and as part of your book um, is that each church kind of has, as part of its heritage and its history, it kind of develops a personality along the way. Um, you use the analogy of a river to explain that. Um, Given your long history at New Life Church, if you had to reflect back on its history and its heritage and identify a personality trait, you know, if you were going to submit us to like a Myers-Briggs or something like that, what personality type would you give New Life Church? <laughs> okay, uh, interesting one. Yes, I do. Uh, I mean, the reason I talk about local church as a river is because uh, I need help with a philosophy of what local church is. True. Uh, it's very easy to get a grasp of what church with a big C around the world is. Yeah. It's the bride of Christ. There's yes. the image. Yeah, yeah. It's the body. Okay. Um, and I, I've always found it interesting how people struggle to define what a local church is. Is it a passage of leaders? Is that what keeps it the same through history? Yeah. Is it a certain a family in the church who've always been there through gener is that what every church has one of those families yeah <laughs> is it a building you know that kind of and of course it isn't any of those things uh so i i, I describe local churches as a river which somehow in the past god allowed to start yeah okay. either it joined with another stream or or god just caused it to happen it was planted and started and then along its journey through time in in the locality where it is it flows and, and meanders, you know? Yeah. And it picks up sediment and it drops off sediment. It makes a difference through the landscape. Yes. And um, I think th by thinking of it that way, we then can arrive at a point where we think, right, our job is 
to get what's in that river to the landscape at the side of the river yeah. in our generation as it throw, flows past us. And that's going to carry on flowing, and we will have gone. Yes. Okay, it'll be yeah. another generation. Um, and for me, that's just a helpful way of seeing it. What is in the sediment of our river as new life? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I do think that we... So when I've read through the annals of our history, and as a young boy and as a teen teenager, and I remember the things we got up to, we were often in this locality the first to do things. Okay. We haven't always been the best to do things, okay? But that needn't necessarily be part of our identity. We have been the first. So dare I use the word trailblazing? Okay. Or, you know, in an odd way, apostolic in that sense you're building a foundation. In the entrepreneurship and the startup kind of yeah. sense of the word, yeah. Or, uh, as Sam would call it, um, may waking. We 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 make a way, you know. Um, we, I, I think that's an important part of identity. Okay. And I think it still is. Um, in, even in recent history, the first to set up a, uh, a homeless hostel in the whole county. Um, you know, the first to set up a a place for women, uh, which is also program based as yeah. well. Those those kind of things, and I think we're still up to things in that way. So I think that's that's one one thing. Throughout our whole history, we have also been uh, embracing, accepting, and warm in the main. Every church has its problems at that, but I. I know that when people come to our church, you know, they fill in those online forms yep. saying, what was your first experience of new life? Your first first impression. Yeah. yeah, they just say, you know, it was warm and cuddly and we, you know, we felt welcomed and those kind of things. That's part of identity. And let's not take that for granted because some churches aren't. You've been to them. I've been to them. Yep. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and so I think there are some things about us I could mention about praise as well. We're not particularly a high jumpy around praising church. Yeah. Okay. But boy, when when that praise turns into a kind of corporate devotion, something is drawn out of us. I don't know why that is, but I've noticed that through the through the decades. So I think there are those kind of things. But there are also things we've got to recover. Okay. That are in our river, and we've let them settle to the bottom so the church started from um an evangelistic crusade yeah in a big tent in the middle of crosby yeah okay. on a roundabout i believe on a roundabout <laughs> a roundabout you can go around both ways and uh we need to recover some of that evangelistic fervor okay. not not doing it the way our grandfathers did it but having the fervor they had to do it the way we can do it no very good right so somehow we've got to recover that. And I don't just mean in a few people doing a few projects. I mean, throughout the church, we also need to recover a, a sense of personal devotion and personal prayer. In fact, I'm just thinking now, Dan, Dan it was you three yep. years ago who organized a reveal survey. For yes. Us. We canvassed the church and asked them very personal questions. About their life of faith. Yeah. <laughs> about their life of faith. Um. And their answers were, were given anonymously, and uh, we looked through all those answers. And it was very clear that relatively low scoring was personal prayer, personal devotion, yep. and personal witness. Yes, yeah, those three, I think, registered, um, um, I think, the lowest across the board. Yeah, so so we need to recover those, because in our past, they would have scored highly, I would suggest. So, yeah, okay. And I think we, we're putting things on our agenda to help us. With those kinds so of we've they, got Chris Duffett with us next weekend, for example, and not just next weekend, but four times this four year, times on this Sunday year. mornings, um, to kind of help just inspire us, I guess, uh, as well as then equip and release us in the area of evangelism yeah. and witness. This idea that um, witness and evangelism isn't something that's that's corporately organised by the church in the form of an event, although it can be, but actually the most normal form of witness is simply sharing your story with somebody yeah, yeah. else and being like we spoke about earlier that encouragement in your workplace being something different in the high street rather than in this gathered context that yeah, we have yeah. here yeah irrigating the land you know if we 
and and I think this is where we can go back to what you said. It it it's harder to it, it's easier to stay in the river than to dig channels that yeah. irrigate the land. Yeah. But dig channels we must, and that's our personal witness and our evangelistic walk in our daily lives. But as we do it, you can cause dead land to become live. You know, Psalm eighty four. They make desert a place of springs. Yeah. Wouldn't that be great? It'd be a great thing to be known as, is irrigators and 20 desert. odd yeah. years ago, Dan, yeah. I preached a sermon. Um, I can't remember many of the sermons I preached, <laughs> but this one I can. It was called Stream Makers. And it was on Psalm 84. And it still resonates with me today. Okay. Maybe I might even put find it on cassette tape, digitize <laughs> it, and put a link up for it. Because okay. it, it describes our land, actually. It describes... Lincolnshire, and it comes back to the people who are supposed to make dry places yeah. wet. Which North Lincolnshire is traditionally. It is. It's it's incredibly well irrigated. You don't need to go far out of Scunthorpe before you find ditches just yes, everywhere. everywhere. Um, I've taken up running in the last quarter or so, and part of the challenge I'm having is trying to plan a run outside of Scunthorpe because yeah. you can't get anywhere before you suddenly run into a it's ditch. True. right? It's and true. then Or you've got to run miles to get to the other end of it before you can then come back again. And I'm just not running that far. Like, no. North Lincolnshire is incredibly well irrigated. It, it wasn't always that way and perhaps Absolutely we need right. to recapture some of that in our own yeah. dna one of the things that we've noticed and perhaps you guys have noticed this as well is that um it's been appearing on social media it's been appearing in uh, sermons we've noticed some language appearing mystically as if by accident <laughs> um and they're these three words here there and everywhere Yes, they've kind of been on on Facebook, on Instagram. I think you've mentioned them a couple of times through uh, the church series. Is that deliberate? Is that completely coincidental? Um, have you got anything else that you want to say on that? Well, here, there, and everywhere is a common cliche. Yes, you, you didn't invent it. I yeah. didn't invent it. No. So whenever whenever you want to talk about something that you can't get a grip on, yeah, you could say oh, it was just here, there, and everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know those. Get a frozen garden peas that you've just spilled in the kitchen. They're, they're here, there, and everywhere. Okay? Yeah. And I, I love that idea, right, that um, local church, and particularly new life, can be described or should be able to be described as getting up to whatever we do here, there, and everywhere. Okay. So, I mean, wouldn't it be great if, if someone came up to you um, and said, hey, Dan, uh, where does new life worship? Here, there, and everywhere. Here, there, and everywhere. So you don't just say here on Brumblewood Lane, although most people might think that's where all the big crowd is. You know, all a crowd really says, a crowd says something's going on here. That's that's what a crowd says yeah. at its most minimum level. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we worship here, there, and everywhere. Well, we certainly worship here and there at the moment. Yeah. So here, yeah, right where we're broadcasting from, Brumblewood Lane. And the there, I would suggest, are the sites where we run uh, our specialist projects from and our amazing small groups, yep. uh, 18 places. Across northern uh, Lincolnshire. Across northern Lincolnshire. That's certainly the there. Yeah. The everywhere is wherever we as individuals. Wherever new lifers might happen yeah. to be. Okay. Yeah. It'd be great if someone came to us and said, how many sites have you got? You know, right. how many campuses have you Hundreds. got? Past it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're just here, there and everywhere. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, where do you? Where does New Life pray? Here. Mm -hmm. Okay. We need to work on that. Yep. There, we need to make sure our small groups are praying places, yep. and uh, and everywhere our our people are great representatives of Jesus, and they they pray everywhere, and not just as part of their own personal devotion, I guess, but coming back to that idea of witnessing and being uh, being brave in our contexts, but not just praying for their needs in their homes as part of their daily devotions as great as that may be but being bold to pray for other people yeah i've, I've lost count of the amount of times that somebody goes oh i've got a bit of a sore back today you know you just small talk at the bus stop and uh and sometimes i'll think oh i could pray for that but often i don't and yet you know research would tell us that nine times out of ten if somebody if you say to somebody oh i'm really sorry to hear about that could could i pray for you they might say no but they're more likely to either go, I don't mind, or yes, right? Statistically, yeah, they're yeah, more yeah. likely to say, 
sure because even if they don't believe that prayer does anything they yep. seem to respect the fact that you believe that Absolutely prayer might change right. something and i think it's an opportunity for us for sure yeah and i think one this one thing this season well it's shown us many things hasn't it it's been a, an earthquake for the, the church yep. globally but i think one thing it's shown us is that uh, our emphasis has to be more on the there and the everywhere than it does on the here okay so I, I don't think this is totally true about new life because as, as certainly in the last three decades, I've certainly, and I know the team, the leadership team have had a passion for small groups and before that, you know, a cellular way of doing church. Um, but um, we have, I guess, fallen foul of the trap that many churches across the world have, which is saying, hey, all you who are everywhere, uh, help us do the here better. Come and help us do the here more polished. Yeah. Help us do the the here in a way that really, wow, there's some way. Yeah. And and there is a switch and there is a purposeful purposeful switch I want to happen. And I know it'll be a slow, you know, paneling out where we in the here yeah. are saying, yes, please help us. Please help us. We need your help to help us equip. The there and the everywhere, yeah, better, yeah. Our small group leaders have been our champions over the past, you know, year, mm. without a doubt. And we want to plant more small groups. We do. We need assistant small group leaders to be small group leaders. Yeah. We want to plant more expressions of church that yeah. have our flavour. They still have what's in our stream, but they're in new parts of North Lincoln. New irrigations. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah new irrigation channels, and we want. Uh, we want individuals to feel resourced. Yeah. Now, of course, it's a two-way thing. You've got to buy in to the house yeah. and to the family. You know, you've got you've got to be part to of the it. here. Yes. Yeah. You you've got to give in to the here in both your what do we say time, talent, and treasure. Yeah. But our emphasis is certainly on making sure that new life scattered is as strong and as effective it can be. Yeah in representing who he is no brilliant yeah i mean the here there and everywhere it's it's something that when i first kind of heard you mention it I, it struck me as something that we well, normally use it in kind of a higgledy piggledy sense of the word like where have you been oh, here there and everywhere. i've just been flustered i've been rushed off my feet but you're talking about it more as kind of a, a way of strategizing yeah, or yeah, organizing yeah. around a common purpose yeah fantastic and um, i think that's it for time uh, so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to close in prayer and then we're going to hand over to um to a video um which for you guys to watch and then i think that's pretty much it pastor Sarah is going to pop up after the video to close as well lord jesus thank you for our time this morning and um, thank you for the um for the wisdom that you've given russ over the course of this series for his uh for his desire to reflect on this uh, strange organism called church and just consider whether or not this is anything like what you've called us to be and to do Lord God, over the coming days, weeks and months, would you cause in us a boldness uh, and a desire to be not just here, but here, there and everywhere. In your name we pray.